Good morning, my name is Spencer. I'm one of the pastors of Mill City Church of Casey. Uh, so we are not gathering together for worship uh, this morning. We're going to listen to the wisdom of uh, the governing authorities that are telling us to, 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 uh, to not gather together. And uh, this is uh, not a long-term goal for us, right? We, uh, we had no aspirations of starting an e-campus, uh, but we're going to roll with the technology that we have. Uh, to try to continue this rhythm of continuing to gather together for uh, worship uh, on Sunday, even if it is uh, apart from one another. Uh, we want to continue this so that we can uh, continue to, to sing songs, we can continue to listen to sit under the authority of God's Word until we can uh, safely come back together and worship together again. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. So you can go ahead and flip there and follow along with us as we walk through this uh, today. All right, so this is the first, uh, really the first time in a hundred years since the Spanish flu that our country and the whole world has been under the threat of, of this type uh, of pandemic with this type of, of fear and this size and scale. So about two months ago, uh, my wife and I were getting ready to go on a cruise and uh, I follow the news very closely. I also follow international news and I saw this small report uh, that was monitoring a situation in China uh, that this new virus had popped up and uh, and as I read it I said went to my wife and said honey you know we were about ready to leave on Sunday but this is something we need to monitor like I you know it, most of the time uh, these things aren't uh, as big a deal I remember swine flu from over a decade ago I got the swine flu back then it wasn't that big of a deal so I just said look we're gonna monitor this but I don't think it's going to be a big deal and uh, and that was kind of the tone Two months ago, this is something that was foreign that actually couldn't happen here. And then when you fast forward a month, uh, every uh, week that has progressed since then, uh, things have gotten more and more uh, real. Things have escalated. When we started uh, watching sports teams play in front of empty stadiums and then all of a sudden games got canceled, March Madness got canceled, seasons got canceled, it became more and more real. Uh, it started with, hey, look at all these um, crazy people making a run at, at toilet paper and hand sanitizer. This is pretty crazy. And it shifted pretty quickly into, oh no, are we going to have enough to get by? Am I going to keep my job? Are my hours going to be cut? How are we going to make it through this? What if uh, I get sick? What if my kids get sick? What if my parents get sick? The whole tone has completely shifted over the last few weeks. And as we are facing this threat, I want us to, to actually to take a step back and realize this is not the first time that the church has faced a threat like this. It's not. The Spanish flu of 1918 was not the first time that the church faced a threat like this. For the last 2,000 years, the church has gone through uh, different seasons where uh, plagues and sicknesses have wreaked havoc on the world. I got to read this article this week that, that covered some of this that went through kind of a, a quick kind of church history over the last 2,000 years of what this has looked like. Uh, back in the second century, uh, there was a plague, the plague of Anton, Antonine. Uh, it wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, and 25% of the Roman Empire, that's the estimate, about a quarter of the empire died during this period. And to put that in perspective, that's around 82 million Americans is a quarter of our population. And when that happened, uh, the, the church responded. The gospel spread because the church cared for those who were sick. This happened again in the third century. Uh, the plague of Cyprian came along. And again, it started to wreak havoc on the Roman Empire. And there, was one, uh, uh, there was one witness at the time that said, Heedless of danger, Christians took charge of the sick. Uh, in the following century, there was a, a pagan emperor, uh, Julian, who uh, really did not like how Christians were, were caring for Roman citizens. He looked back at this plague, uh, and he uh, it has a quote where he said, uh, These Galileans, which is a term for Christians, these Galileans would care not just for their own, but for others. And for people like him, it was frustrating that lowly Christians would care for high-class Roman citizens. But this is what the church has done. You can fast forward all the way to the Reformation. In the Reformation in, in 1527, the bubonic plague resurfaced 
uh, in Wittenberg, Germany. And that is where Martin Luther was at the time. And there was a lot of calls for everyone to, to leave Wittenberg because of the plague. And this is what Martin Luther, uh, who started the Reformation, said. He said, we die at our posts. Christian doctors cannot abandon their hospitals. Christian governors cannot flee their districts. Christian pastors cannot abandon their congregations. The church has a long history of responding in the midst of plague and pestilence and sickness. Now, when you look at all that church history, uh, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to see how Christians have responded to this over the years. But how do we actually take that and apply it to our current situation? Our current situation where they're saying social distancing or keeping yourself away from others actually helps save lives, that it helps flatten the curve of exponential growth of this virus. How do we apply uh, what the Bible teaches and what our church history has shown us and how Christians have responded to this current crisis? That's what I want us to take a look at today. I want to first uh, continue in Matthew, uh, in Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50. Uh, as we look at this, Jesus is going to give us uh, an eternal perspective uh, to how we look at one another in the church. And then I want to take a moment and broaden out a little bit and see how the Bible gives us wisdom for how to respond right now. So uh, let me pray and we will jump into the text. Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. This is different for us. Uh, but your word is still powerful. It still cuts through to our hearts. It still gives us hope and perspective and wisdom and truth. So I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, verse 46. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother... And his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus is continuing to teach uh, throughout Matthew 12. And we know from uh, Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel accounts of this story that Jesus is teaching in a house. This house has become crowded and, uh, and his mother and brothers show up and they want to see him, which is a completely normal situation. Uh, his mother Mary went on to have more kids with Joseph. These are Jesus' younger brothers. And they've come to see him. They've come to talk to him. And then Jesus pauses in this moment and he uses this as a teaching illustration. He wants to use his family to help illustrate a bigger point. And he says, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. So what Jesus just did is he made a bold statement uh, to this culture. See, uh, their culture at that time highly valued family. There was, there was so much built into your family identity, where you came from, the family name that you, uh, that you had. This was very important to them. Uh, they could trace back their genealogies for, uh, for centuries and centuries. There was so much uh, built into your family. Also, this is where you would have inherited your trade. So most people inherited the trade of their forefathers. This is a way that you provided for yourself and for your future prosperity and your family. There was so much built into family. This is also a shame-honor culture. And in a shame-honor culture, you, you would uh, want to bring great honor to your family. You would never want to dishonor them. There was so much built into how much you loved, cared for your family. So if that's the case, what is Jesus doing here? Jesus is taking a universally understood concept that you would love your family, that you would care for your family, that you would do anything for your family. And he takes that that is understood and then he elevates church family. He elevates the eternal family of God and says all the, all the love and care and respect that you have built into your earthly family, that gets elevated to eternal family. 
He isn't diminishing his earthly family. Over and over again, the Bible is going to teach how much you should honor your father and mother, how much you should provide for your family. Earthly family matters, but he just takes that and elevates it to help them see the importance of eternal family because what he is doing is he is forming this new concept of the eternal church, the eternal family of God. And he is going to reinforce this. The Bible is going to reinforce this over and over again throughout the New Testament. Let me just take a few of the passages that help reinforce uh, the importance of the family of God. 1 John 1, 12-13 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There's this this new family that is born out of the will of God and has redemption of his people. This shows up again in 1 John 3, 1. It says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. That is the doctrine of adoption, that we are not born as children of God. We don't come to this world as his children. We come to this world children of wrath, of disobedience, but God and his redemption redeems his People brings them into his family and makes them children of God. This shows up again in Galatians 6.10. It says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. So do good to everyone. That is being good to all of your neighbors, but also especially those who are part of the household of God, those who are part of the family of God. Romans 12.5 says, So we, uh, though many, are one body in Christ individually, and individually members of one another. That we are members of a greater household, a greater family. We belong to one another. Let me just give you one more. 1 Timothy 5.1-2 says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. That there's this new uh, changing language of you have uh, fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers in the church and this eternal family of God. The New Testament is going to teach this over and over and over again. That for those of us who believe in Jesus, or as Jesus puts it here in Matthew 12, 50, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. For those who believe in him, for those of them who live in his will we belong to an eternal family of God and it's just understood you have earthly family members that you love that you care about and he says that kind of love elevate that even more so for this eternal family of God that I'm going to purchase with my blood at the cross I was uh I was in a house uh, not too long ago and uh, there was a uh, the woman who owned the house was was telling me about uh, the history of this house. And she was explaining over the last, uh, uh, over decades and decades, that this house was actually basically a, make- a makeshift hospital uh, for different family members who, who were sick and dying. And she just started pointing out different rooms in the house where different parents and different family members were sick. Uh, she pointed to the front living room. She said, you see this, this living room? She said, for a while we had a hospital bed right in the middle of it. We couldn't really invite people over. Our house isn't that big enough to host people. This was the room where we host people, but we had to stop because this family member was sick and they needed to be cared for. And then she pointed to a room right next to us, the kitchen. She said, look, you see this kitchen? She said, this is where my mother died. We cared for her throughout years of, uh, throughout a period of sickness as she was dying. She said, you see this room behind me? You see, my husband added on to this, uh, added on this room to the house. We had to put another family member in this room as they were sick, as they were dying. And she made this point, and she was uh, illustrating how this house had become a hospital. And then she went on to say, I just don't understand people that won't care for their own, that won't take care of their own family. She's like, this house isn't that big, but but we, we care for our own. We care for our family. I just don't understand people that won't care for their own family. And as I think about uh, really, the, the, the words that she was saying and the truth she was illustrating, I think about that in the context of this moment right now, in the context of what Jesus just taught. What kind of Christians would we be if we didn't care for our own church family, 
that in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of everything that is going on, what kind of people would we be if we didn't care for our own church family, our own brothers and sisters and the household of God? In this present crisis, we have to care for one another. For those who are suffering, we're going to have to step up. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 26. It says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. I remember when I was uh, 15, I was in a very serious car accident. Uh, I was doing some distracted driving. Uh, it wasn't texting and driving, because that wasn't a thing back then. But I was messing with the radio, and uh, I, I drove off the road. I swerved and overcorrected. I didn't have my seatbelt on, the window was down, and the truck began to flip. It threw me out of the truck, and then it rolled on top of me. And I was pinned underneath the truck. And it was obviously a very traumatic experience. I remember uh, I, I wasn't knocked out for any of it. I was, I was conscious for all of it. And I remember uh, thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. I couldn't breathe. I was, it, was, it was traumatic. Uh, but it was also traumatic for my family. You see, this accident happened only a mile away from my house. Uh, and I was stuck underneath this truck for, uh, for quite a while as the, as the firefighters were working to, to get it off me safely. And my, so it, it gave enough time for, for, for my mom, for different family members to show up uh, and see me underneath this truck. And then when I got met back to the hospital, uh, uh, more families showed up uh, realizing how serious the situation was. And I remember specifically my brother, uh, Sean, who's a part of our, of our church family, uh, he was living in Charleston at the time. He was kind of disconnected from, from me and from our family, but he showed up. And I remember from that moment forward that he became an active part uh, of my life again and uh, more of an active part of our, of our family, that our whole family came together uh, because the reality was is that when one person suffers in our family, we all suffer, that we love one another. We, we rally around the person that suffers. This happens in, in most families. If someone suffers, if someone's hurting, if someone dies, the response is we are together in this and we will get through this together. How much more so for the family of God in the midst of this crisis, when one suffers, do we rally together and care for one another? This is our calling. There's going to be people in our church that will suffer. I mean, we, we, we've read the, the news reports. I mean, we, we've seen that while this, this virus affects everyone, it has an intensified effect on those who are elderly. The reality is, is that in the coming weeks, it's very possible that it becomes dangerous for the elderly in our church to go out and do basic tasks like going to get groceries, like running basic errands. The reality is, is that they're going to need help. They're, they're going to be suffering because of this. And it's on us as the church to collectively come together because when one suffers, we all suffer. The reality is, is that there are people in our church who have already had hours cut or are losing their job. And this is going to continue to happen. It's not just the effects of the virus. We are spiraling into what looks like it could be a recession. When one person suffers, we all suffer. This includes financially. So if you are in a position where uh, you have a job where your salary is not going to be changed, where your hours, where you're, uh, you're going to continue to, to, to make the money that you have been making, this is your opportunity as a member of the household of this church to care for your brothers and sisters, to actually continue in giving generously, to give to the needs of those who are financially suffering. And for those of you that, that are financially suffering, they are going to take the hit. Our encouragement to you is to actually let us know. Let us know how we can help you. Sometimes when this happens in the past, uh, that there's a lot of bills that get mounted, uh, rent gets behind, and all of a sudden uh, things are way worse. If we could have gotten out ahead of it uh, earlier, uh, we could have responded more helpfully. So this is your opportunity to let us know as a church family what you are walking through so that we can care for you. There's going to be lots of opportunity uh, in the coming weeks and months to respond to one another's needs. And I want to say this very clearly. Our inaction here, our inaction here, will show us whether we believe the gospel or not. What we do in this moment will, uh, will reveal whether we actually believe this. 
And that's not an overstatement. That's 1 John 3, 16, which says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, that Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers, for the church. Verse 17, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? How can you be a Christian is what it just said. We have to, as a church, feel the force of uh, what the Bible is showing us. We have to see one another as Jesus has laid down his life for us, poured out his love for us, reflecting that love to one another who are suffering. That is the calling for us as the church, to see each other as the eternal family of God with an eternal perspective on all of this, while also understanding there are two of the greatest commandments in the Bible. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor. That we don't just love one another. We especially love one another as the church. We also uh, display the love of Christ to our neighbors. That we care for them. That we uh, consider how they might be suffering too. That we might... Uh, by our actions reflect the gospel and with the hope that because they have seen this real, eternal, hopeful uh, perspective in us, they might ask why we might declare because Jesus is good, because he has redeemed us, because we believe that he's better than everything else. They might actually declare who Jesus is and share the gospel with those uh, who need him in this season. There are going to be opportunities over and over again to display the gospel to display uh, Christ for those who are in the midst of this coronavirus crisis. So we have biblical uh, guidance, we have biblical command and authority shaping us here. We have this uh, historical uh, precedent for how the church has responded. Now what do we do in this context? How do we apply this to this moment right now where we have doctors and scientists that are telling us how this virus spreads? That we should stay distant from our church family, that we should avoid uh, neighbors as a means of safety? How do, we, how do we respond and apply everything that was just said that is true to this moment right now? I want to give us a, a short-term outlook for how we should respond over the next couple of weeks, and I want to, uh, to give us a more uh, long-term outlook over the next couple of months. So let me start with a short-term outlook uh, first and applying uh, the truth of the gospel to our situation right now. Martin Luther, in the midst of the, the bubonic plague that hit Wittenberg, he said this. I'm going to read the first part of this quote. He said, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine, and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order to not become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. That is a, that is a good picture for where we are right now. That over the next few weeks, we should practice that right there. Avoid places and persons where our presence is not needed. The reality is, is that if one of our uh, church, someone in our church family or one of our neighbors gets sick, if that happens right now, there's a hospital bed. There's a place, in, our, in the Midlands at least, where they can be treated. That's, that's true. So for this time right now, stay home. And use this time at home uh, to open up the Bible. Read your Bible. Don't just, just binge on Netflix or Disney+. Plus. Open up the Bible and be shaped by God. Pray for our country. Pray for one another in our church. Listen to some podcasts for some, from some good Christian uh, thinkers. Uh, uh, read fiction. Relax. And enjoy this time and rest. Parents, take some time right now uh, as you have your kids with you uh, to have fun, to love them, uh, to disciple them. Uh, open up the Bible with them. Have some time for family worship to love them. Also remember your group. We can't gather together as groups right now. Uh, we, are, we are gathering separately, but make sure you're checking in on your group FaceTiming. We also have put for our groups, for group meeting time, if you want to, on our website, there's going to be just the ability to literally click uh, the, the picture of one of our group leaders and you will enter into a group chat. 
where you can up, open up the Bible, where you can uh, you can share what's going on in your life, you can study the Bible, uh, you can you can do accountability. But we can stay connected using technology that God has given us uh, as we continue through this situation. So stay home. That's what we're going to do in the short term. But in the long term, what if the landscape changes? What if things progressively start to get worse? What if someone in our church family or one of our neighbors gets sick? They catch this virus and they show up to the hospital. And when they get there, they say, I'm sorry, we don't have a bed or a ventilator for you. We just, we just don't. Here's some medicine. Go home. Isolate yourself. Good luck. Is our response as Christians going to say, no, let's stay distant. Let's protect ourselves. Or are we going to apply the truths of the scripture? Or are we going to look at how our, the, the church has historically responded here? And do our best to, to grab a bandana, to cover our face, to grab some gloves, to go over there and ask, what do you need to survive? What can I get you to help you make it through this? What are we going to do as a church if, if these weeks turns into to months, three months, four months, five months, six months, where they're saying you can't get together at all? How are we going to respond when we have Hebrews 10.25 giving us the, this this picture of not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. There's this expectation that we are called to continue to gather for worship. How are we going to do that long term? Well, to understand this, let me read the back half of this Martin Luther quote. He says, If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will freely, as, uh, but will go freely as stated above, See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. And what he did there was, is he said, we don't have to be foolhardy. We don't have to be foolish and just jump into situations where we're not needed. But also, we apply what the Bible says, that we care for those who are in need. We're going to minister to the, to the sick. We're going to step up as we are called to. How are we going to balance this all Together, How are we going to figure this out and applying all of this? We are going to need an abundance of the wisdom of God. We're going to need a crazy amount of wisdom. We're going to need wisdom to, to, to figure out a few different things. How, how do we continue to, to care for church family like we're called to? To care for our neighbors. We're going to need wisdom as we look at 1 Peter 2 and Romans 13 that tell us we need to submit to uh, the governing authorities, knowing also we have a higher authority in God who calls us to love one another and to love our neighbors. How are we going to respond? How are we going to uh, continue to, to honor what the expe expectation of God's people is to gather together regularly? In order to do this, we're going to need the wisdom of God. We're going to need wisdom to navigate all the challenges that await us as we continue to, to journey through this together. we got some difficult decisions to figure out for ourselves, for one another. Your pastors, we need the wisdom of God. We need your prayers to help navigate this together. The world is scared. Our neighbors are scared. Our, uh, there are people in our church family that are nervous. There's so much uncertainty. But as we close out today, I want us to remember that we have a firm, fixed foundation of hope that never changes. That in the midst of all this chaos, we have a sovereign king and a sovereign Lord that is with us throughout this, pre this present temporary suffering. So I want to close this out from Psalm 91. Uh, I, want to, I want to walk us through this, the first six verses, and then when, uh, when I'm done, I want you to take your Bible, I want you to open up to Psalm 91, and I want you to pray through this psalm. Uh, maybe together with your family, maybe individually. But I want us to, to apply the truths of the scriptures to our situation through prayer, remembering who our God is. Psalm 91, 1 through 6, verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. The picture is, is that for those of us who have trusted in Christ as our, as our eternal hope, we get to hide in the shadow of the Almighty. 
We get to take shelter and protection in him. That's the eternal perspective that we have in Christ. He goes on in verse 2. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust that we remember that in the midst of this uncertain storm, of this hurricane of suffering, that we have a strong refuge, a safe harbor that we get to take our, uh, our refuge in. He will protect us. There is no need to fear. Verse 3 he says, For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will deliver us from this deadly pestilence virus that ultimately because of our faith in Christ because of the eternal perspective that we have no matter what we will ultimately be delivered this too shall pass verse 4 he says he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge his faithfulness is a shield and a buckler that his eternal power protects us that we can hide in the shadow of his wings and the faithfulness, uh, in his faithfulness and his shield. Verse 5 through 6. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noon day. We will not fear the terror of the unknown nor the afflictions that come with it, nor the the pestilence, this virus that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that comes with it. We will not fear because we are not, or we are a people that have a eternal hope, an eternal God who stands in the heavens over us, who provides protection for his people. We remember that God is our sovereign king and we will not be shaken because we stand in him. That is our firm, fixed hope. So may we respond as Christians to the call to care for one another as the church to respond to our neighbors knowing that no matter what, we will make it through this together because our God is eternal and he has us and he holds us in his hands and we will not be shaken. Let me pray. God, may you, uh, may you bring an overwhelming sense of calm and peace over us right now. May you help us respond like the brothers and sisters over the last 2,000 years that responded in loving one another well, in loving our neighbors well. May you give us wisdom, God, wisdom that we absolutely need to figure out the next few weeks and the next few months. And may you help us remember who you are. That no matter what comes at us, no matter what happens over the next few weeks with this virus, with the economy, with whatever, God, you hold us. You are our refuge and you are good. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.